Renaissance Europe The rebirth of classical art and learning has electrified the continent. But in a world devoted to the pursuit of beauty and perfection, the pressures of conforming to unrealistic standards has led people to increasingly extreme and even deadly means of transforming themselves. In the best of all possible worlds, how did beauty come with a terrifying price? The Renaissance is the name given to the period of European history in which ancient ideals of beauty returned to prominence in art and culture. After the rougher stylings of the medieval age, when abstract and religious iconography dominated every creative field, the Renaissance brought the return to physical and humanistic portraits and artworks. Just as in ancient times, specifically ancient Greece and the first two centuries of Imperial Rome, beauty, both male and female, was valued above all else and the pursuit of idealized forms became the common practice of the period. This desire for beauty was not limited to the artistic world. In a society where appearance was cherished to such a degree, people from all classes felt compelled to match the standard, and women in particular resorted to dangerous and even lethal methods to transform themselves from their natural demeanor to the exaggerated fashions of the time. Before we delve into the scary and often horrifying world of Renaissance cosmetics, if you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. In her book, Cosmetics in Shakespearean and Renaissance Drama, Professor Farah Karim Cooper explains the motivation for the use of appearance-altering and even health-damaging substances. Beauty means acceptance, and the pressure is always on. The desire to be beautiful is a social and cultural construct. Early modern woman's drive to refashion herself cosmetically was a response to a particular standard inherited from classical and Italian models of female beauty. 16th and 17th century love poetry and definitions of beauty promises the procurement of courtship and marriage. Poverty during the medieval, renaissance, and early modern periods existed in every country on a level that is only matched by some of the poorest nations on earth in the present day. For example, the gross domestic product, or GDP, of England between 1350 and 1400 was about 1,000 pounds per capita, comparable to the modern nations of Rwanda, Sudan, and Myanmar. Security from absolute poverty and eventual starvation was a very real concern for people of the Renaissance, and as there were virtually no employment prospects for women outside of prostitution, the protection of marriage bore an importance that is difficult to conceptualize in the 21st century. This situation continued until the social revolutions following the Second World War, and the preoccupation with marriage was reflected in countless plays and novels, like Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, which was set in the relatively modern years of the early 1800s. The beauty ideal that Renaissance women were attempting to emulate with their cosmetics was quite different from the Norman modern times too. Whereas the late 20th and early 21st centuries leaned predominantly towards slimmer body shapes, Renaissance artists very much emphasized slightly larger frames with full, healthy appearances. Blonde hair and rose-red lips were the favored looks, with pale skin, dark eyes, flushed cheeks, a high forehead, and small breasts also in vogue. The use of cosmetics to achieve these results had a long history, with the ancient Egyptians using coal to darken the eyes, while the Roman writers Pliny the Elder and Ovid wrote extensively on the creation of beauty products and their ingredients. In Face Paint, The Story of Makeup, cosmetic historian Lisa Eldridge writes, Clear, fair, blemish-free skin was a visible parameter of health and an indicator of fertility, which explains why women spent an inordinate amount of time in the quest for it, regardless of how dearly it cost them or how noxious the substances used might be. A larger body size indicated that the person was prosperous enough to feed themselves well in a time when that was far from the norm and pale skin indicated financial security so that they were not required to work outside for long periods. Turning darker hair to light, blonde hair could be done by applying expensive saffron or lemon juice. Those with lower budgets would make use of onion skin dyes, soda, alum, or sulfur. All of these hair treatments required prolonged periods in the sun to affect their changes, so in order to keep their skin fashionably white, women would sit outside in broad hats with the crowns cut open to expose their hair while wearing long sleeves and heavy dresses to cover their arms and legs. Knowledge of the effects of avoiding sunlight on mental health and vitamin D deficiency have grown in recent years, and those that deprived themselves of sunlight for a fashionably pale appearance would have been subject to fatigue and decreased immunity in the short term, and even rickets in young children, as well as osteoporosis in later years. The noxious substances that Eldridge refers to were also unfortunately prevalent in manufactured cosmetics for the wealthy. 
The coal, first developed by ancient Egyptians for the eyes, likely had a non-cosmetic use, as it repelled the bacteria that caused waterborne eye diseases that are still prevalent in the Nile Delta. Along with burnt almonds and ash, lead and malachite, a copper carbonate hydroxide mineral, were used in the creation of coal, and this recipe continued to be used throughout the Egyptian and Roman periods and up to the Renaissance. While the lead and copper did repel the water bacteria, they also poisoned the wearer, especially with repeated use over a long period. Symptoms of lead poisoning include joint and muscle pain, high blood pressure, and even premature birth, miscarriage, and stillborn children in extreme cases. Red lips and flushed cheeks were another beauty feature that inspired the use of dangerous substances. Renaissance women used vermilion to paint their lips a bright red color, and this compound was derived from powdered mineral cinnabar, itself a derivative of red mercuric sulfide. Vermilion was also used by artists to paint red colors on canvas, an indication of the strength and potency of the mixture. Mercury was an unfortunately common ingredient in Renaissance cosmetics, and its effects over a prolonged period could be catastrophic for the wearer. The 16th century Italian painter Gianpaolo Lomazzo warned against the use of mercury and lead on the skin in his 1596 treaty, a tract containing the arts of curious painting, carving, and building, saying that women, instead of beautifying, they do most vilely disfigure themselves, and wherefore such women use it about their face, have always black teeth, standing far out of their gums like a Spanish mule, in offensive breath, with a face half scorched, and an unclean complexion. In addition to the blushing effects of vermilion, when it was thought that the complexion was also not light enough, compounds were available to enhance the pale appearance of women in society. Although skin whitening mixtures were common as far east as Korea and Japan, European women in the Renaissance used cirrus, a compound first developed in Venice and then spread through France and later England. Cirrus contained a mixture of vinegar and lead, and it gave a white mask effect on the skin that was highly fashionable toward the latter half of the Renaissance and into the early modern period. Such an overwhelming makeup could be used to hide the effects of ordinary aging, as well as scarring from diseases at the time, like smallpox. Ironically, in addition to being uncomfortable, vinegar and lead both dry and strip the soft skin of the face, accelerating the aging process and thus necessitating greater and greater use of the cirrus to mask the effects it had brought to the wearer. Remarkably, there were other, even more extreme beauty treatments that came from the Italian Renaissance than vermilion and cirrus. There are stories of women asking their doctors to apply leeches to the backs of their ears in an attempt to drain blood from the face for their evening soirees, as well as the practice of dropping extract of the poisonous belladonna plant directly onto the eyeballs in order to dilate and increase the size of the pupils. One very notable historical example of a woman who was forced to resort to using these harmful practices was Queen Elizabeth I of England. In her early life, the future monarch had been noted for her good looks, and she was known to eschew the use of cosmetics. A damaging bout of smallpox in 1562, while the queen was 29, left her missing large portions of her hair and disfigured with scarring. The queen used the contemporary Venetian cirrus to conceal the damage from her subjects, courtiers, and foreign ambassadors, along with vermilion rouge on her lips and cheeks. The use of the cosmetic on a daily basis over a period of decades would have exacerbated the problem with both her skin and hair, leaving it gray and withered, as well as the lead poisoning contributing to further hair loss. The queen was also said to have left the makeup on for up to a week before washing it off, using a cleaning agent that contained yet more mercury. And at the time of her death, she was reported to have had an inch of makeup on her face. The joint pain and swelling as well as depression that the queen suffered in her later years are also consistent with the symptoms of lead and mercury poisoning. A German visitor to the court in the 1590s gives the following description of the queen's appearance, which would seem to support this idea. Her face, oblong, fair but wrinkled. Her eyes, small, yet black and pleasant. Her nose, a little hooked. Her lips, narrow, and her teeth, black. Her hair was of an auburn color, but false. Even though knowledge of the harmful effects of lead and mercury cosmetics seems to have been known, judging by the works of writers like Lomazzo and even the late 16th century physician of the French court, Ambois Père, their usage continued through the Renaissance and into the Baroque and Georgian periods before finally dying out with the more muted and conservative fashions of the Victorian age. One of the most famous women in Britain, Maria Gunning, Countess of Coventry, died in 1760 due to lead poisoning at the premature age of 27. The public knowledge of her cause of death likely contributed to the decline in usage of lead-based cosmetics from that time. But as we know, people remained prone to endangering their health and well-being in the name of fashion and beauty. Why this drive towards self-destruction exists is a topic for another video. 
but hit us up in the comments below with your thoughts. We'd love to hear them. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.